uh, please just type them in the chat room. We have a wonderful group of volunteers who will monitor that chat. Um, we may ask you to wait until the end for a question and answer section if we feel um, it's an understanding questions and we'll definitely bring that up with Gil. So, Gil Broza is a seasoned Agile Coast facilitator, trainer, speaker, manager, and developer with two years of experience in diverse environments and capacities. He owns and operates 3P Vantage. He helps organizations increase agility and team performance. Um, and he has also written three books, including The Human Side of Agile. You may see them in the back there on his bookshelf, I'm not sure. Um, and he has also told me earlier that sometimes he likes a little thrill and he has walked on the edge of Sea Tower in Toronto 1100 feet off the ground. So that's a little information about him. Um, today he will explain to us a not so short list of not so simple factors to make real collaboration possible, as well as a process you can use for determining which actions would establish or increase collaboration in your team. Thank you, Gil, for being with us here today. All right, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So quick thumbs up if you can see the slides, all good? Yeah, wonderful. So uh, we are going to start actually with a little discussion just to set the stage. Um, the instructions like you heard are in this Google Doc and the link is in the chat. So I'm gonna put the next slide on, but once you're in the breakout room, you won't see the slide. That's why you need the Google Doc. So um, my hosts will put you in breakout rooms of three people each and you get three minutes. Three minutes to discuss this question. So a little bit of reflection, a little bit of discussion. If your team collaborated more than they already do, what, what sort of outcomes would that accomplish or improve? Now, as you do that, you will probably want to introduce yourselves to each other, and that's great, but you're really efficient with your time because after three minutes, Zoom will cut you off. So make sure you have time for the conversation. All right, folks, um, I'm gonna ask you to be very quick, take like, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, and actually write in the chat like in a few words, what, what you came up with in your conversation. What would collaboration do for you? Oh, I was here waiting for, um, we came up with, um, uh, it would, uh, we'd, we'd be able to get a better flow of customer value. Awesome. <laughs> It's three work, but it's quality. <laughs> After your team, stuff with it, right? Your mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Creating bonds between teammates. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so it's clarity. So if, if you watch the chat, you know, there is excellent stuff there, right? And, uh, you know, Dishan, you have an excellent point of the recent transition to work from home. Absolutely, right? Um, collaboration will help us with team culture. Okay, good. So now, let's go back to, um, to the policy. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. There seems to be general consensus that collaboration is a good thing, right? And what you wrote in the chat clearly conveys that, okay? Uh, very few people that I'm aware of think that collaboration is a bad thing. Agile is huge in collaboration, right? It's a principle, it's everywhere. Um, however, uh, at least in my experience, um, few teams actually enjoy real collaboration. They'll be friendly, they'll be polite, they'll be helpful, they'll cooperate, but they don't really collaborate. And what's particularly um, disturbing is that um, it's fairly easy to explain why that is. Right? So the reasons are not always obvious. Um, so you heard, you know, in the reason introduction, I've been meaning and doing and teaching Agile for 20 years now, but uh, collaboration is something that I you know, started paying attention to long before. It always interested me to see um, how people get stuff done and how they work together. Um, so clearly, you know, calling into Agile is a good thing for me. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is really the result of, I'd say, in over 30 years of um, just observing, observing how people collaborate or not. And when they do, why that is, and um, you know, is this of that is in, a, in an agile environment? Jill, uh, yeah. Very sorry to interrupt you, but it's really quite hard to hear what you're saying. Uh, maybe hmm. if you can adjust your microphone, that would help. Okay. And the microphone seems to be at the maximum. Uh, maybe put it up a little bit. Can you try that? I, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Just speak really loud. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
so what I'm going to be sharing with you is really from, you know, so many years of looking at this thing. And so here's what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to look at collaboration versus cooperation. This is going to be really um, setting the stage for us. Then we're going to look at prerequisites, conditions, uh, necessary but not sufficient conditions for people to collaborate, any two, any two people really. And then we're going to look at deterrence, right? So even after all those conditions are met, what might happen that prevents people or discourages them from collaborating? And then I'm going to tie this all up together into a process so that you, you can take steps, specific steps, back in the office or virtually to help your team uh, with greater collaboration. You have a handout. Again, the link for it is in the chat. Uh, we're going to use the handout a little later. Uh, but it's, it's good as a follow along, and if you want to take notes, by all means. Um, if I were presenting to you uh, the same in person, I would actually be giving you a printed handout, but today we're going to settle for the uh, digital version. Okay, so definition. <clears throat> collaboration. Whenever I ask people to define collaboration, I get the first line of text. It's working together to accomplish a shared objective. Good. I like to raise the bar. I like to say it's not just about working together, it's also coming from a sense of ownership, joint ownership. So whether it's two people or several, joint ownership of the results, right? So it's not just we do our part. What you have here on the slides are pictures of cases of collaboration. Kafka is their programming, right? So it's never about you know having one screen or two, it's having two brains on the job. Um, on the right is a daily stand-up. Uh, stand-ups don't usually so use swords, the skin did. Doesn't matter, but it's a it's a collaborative exchange among team members. What do you see on the bottom left? That's modding. So I'm sure many of you have heard about mob programming. What you're seeing here is actually mob analysis. These are five VAs, and they are solving a task together. Right? They're doing data modeling in this particular case, and um, they are in it together. They're not just passing pieces of work between themselves. Uh, what I have for you on the bottom right uh, comes from um, something else I like to do. So um, um, I like to do races, adventure races. Um, I participate every year in a race, a charity race modeled after the uh, amazing race that you see on TV. And this is um, this race, this one out of 12, by these amazing directors, race directors. They're a team. They're a collaborative team. So even though they specialize, and you know, one person looks after you know building challenges, and another person looks after the volunteers and blah blah blah. They always fill in for each other. They, anytime there's any need, somebody can step in. So a collaborating team, not just a, not just a shared objective. Not let's look at cooperation. So in cooperation, we still have a shared objective. But every participant focuses on completing their own part. Now, the classic example is the relay race, right? In the relay race, everybody is part of the team winning. But each individual really has a part to play, and when that part is over, it's over. That's it. Um, what you see on the right is sort of the uh, example we've been used to, which is, you know, the developer does one piece, the UA does another. And we put them in separate places, put them close, separating them and, and so on. So the idea is that every participant focuses on completing their own part. Now, why should we collaborate? Again, whenever I ask people, I get this type of answer. And what you wrote in the chat, what you discussed in your room, this is correct. This is absolutely right. But I want to give you an additional perspective, the perspective of what happens if we don't. What happens if we work on our own? Which is sort of the default, right, for most people. All sorts of risks can materialize into issues. When we work on our own, we might misunderstand, we might get tired, uh, forget to tell, forget to ask, um, the tunnel vision gets stuck, and so on and so forth. Now, it's not that collaboration eliminates that, but it definitely reduces it. And so, um, I would say that collaboration is an agile principle, not just because it amplifies the positives, but also because it reduces the downsides. And nowadays, when we have mobbing and swarming that are becoming more and more popular, uh, that's just taking it to an extreme. Okay. So does that mean that you should have full-on collaboration all the time in your team? I mean, some people kind of imply that. I don't think so. 
to me, um, this is really a case of um, balance being necessary. You need a balance of collaboration on some things, maybe most, cooperation on others, and sometimes solo ownership, and that's totally normal, okay? Now, how would you know what the balance is? There's no standard answer there. So what I have here for you is just you know, some factors that are pretty obvious, right? Of course, the nature of the work that it takes, uh, dictates uh, what type of collaboration would, or balance would be necessary. The personalities would even indicate what's welcome uh, if there are future needs. Um, you might want to use collaboration to study knowledge. Uh, and of course, there's those, you know, individual things that make us human, right? Pride and accomplishment and accomplishment and so forth. They also play into this. Because, you know, as much as we like to say in, in the Agile community that, you know, we're part of the team and we're in this together and whatever, people still want to feel important, right? It's a cornerstone of motivation. People want to feel contributing and important and collaboration definitely makes it possible, but it's something that makes it, makes it harder to see. So, so there's that. Now, uh, before we continue, we're going to click in the same breakout rooms again, okay? And this time, you're going to get something like two and a half minutes to, to come up with a specific example because, you know, this talk is about the abstraction, right? So I would like you to have a specific example in mind, whether it's current or from a recent team. Okay, if you're between jobs, think about the recent team, even a team from two years ago, it doesn't quite matter. The point is if you have a specific example in mind where collaboration doesn't occur or doesn't occur quite enough, uh, but it should. Like according to you, it should. And, and also really identify why you want that. Why you, you want that. So uh, we're going to put you in the rooms now, and when we come back, we're going to get started. Process. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So it's important that everybody has an example because again, this stuff is abstract. And now let's, uh, let's get started, right? Let's look at those nine prerequisites for really any person to collaborate with others. Now, before I go to the first one, I want to um, basically give you some background about these. One is they apply even if you already have a team, right? So even if your group already feels joint ownership, there's no five dysfunctions, stuff like that, they still apply. The team might have shared ownership, but still may not quite collaborate. Uh, they apply to every individual in the collaboration, right? So if one wants and two don't, it's not going to happen. Now, I'm going to show them to you in a sequence, in a very specific sequence, uh, because I believe we treat them as mental filters. So when we're placed in a situation where there's some work to do and collaboration is a possibility, uh, we mentally consider very quickly, it's subconscious, the first filter. And if it passes, we go to the second. And if it passes, we go to the third. The first one that doesn't apply, we drop, we go do our own thing. So as I review them, I, I suggest that you kind of reflect on, you know, how they apply to your situation and whether they explain uh, really what's going on for you. Uh, and the last thing I want to say as background is that, you know, this stuff is my work. This is not some scientific theory. This is not the book that I'm, you know, telling you from. Uh, this is really based on my observation from you know, that long um, doing this stuff. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. So the first prerequisite for, you know, collaboration is that we even have compelling reasons to, to join forces in any form. What you see on the slide are just examples of, you know, reasons that are related to the result, such as, you know, I could need help here, or, you know, if we work together, this would be better. But it's also beyond the results. Maybe it's a growth opportunity, okay? Or maybe this is a chance to help the team grow, like we saw in some of the um, outcomes that you guys wrote in the chat. I want to give you an example for that. Um, as some of you might know, um, I teach workshops. There's one particular one that I teach with Johanna Rothman, um, who's you know a management consultant in Agile out of Boston, and we teach you know a workshop to help transformation leaders you know be more successful. I could do it on my own. She could do it on her own. Yet we have chosen to join forces on this one because we think that you know, the outcomes are bigger than what we could accomplish on our own. So, so there is that compelling reason. Uh, <clears throat> once we have a compelling reason, we need those reasons to justify not merely joining forces, but actually collaborating. Okay? I want to give you a positive example and a negative example. So the positive example 
Um, so another example from my personal life, there's gonna be many personal examples here uh, from non-work situations. Uh, I love to do escape rooms. Uh, I'm sure many of you have done escape rooms as well. Basically, it's a series of puzzles with a time limit and you're in a group and sometimes it's dark and things like that. But uh, definitely a time pressure thing and you know, a very you know, cognitive heavy type of work. I love doing that with my family. Every time we go, we have an option. We can work together, collaborate on puzzles, or we can split up. We can split up and basically parallelize our efforts, sort of like companies try to do with individuals. And this, it's possible that we'll actually do better this way. It is possible that by splitting up and you know, separating our labor, we would actually finish sooner. But in our experience, um, working together creates a better experience. It creates memories. It creates a family experience for us. And this matters to us more than winning. Sure, if we collaborate and win, awesome, right? And it happens, mostly. Uh, I wish. Uh, but it's, it's just more fun for us. That's why we do it together. The negative example is what we have here on the slide, right? Look at this, right? We have the roles. We have the designer supposing to do design. Right? That's what the license plate says, the great designer. Tester does their own thing. Architect does their own thing, and so on. And what's really going on here is that, you know, with people self-identifying with their titles um, and, and roles, what, what we have then is not enough um, motivation to really collaborate and more the invitation for people to do their own thing. Um, <clears throat> If anybody is looking at these two reasons that, um, sorry, two reasons, two prerequisites that I shared with you, the compelling reasons and the reasons justifying collaboration. Um, and you're saying, you know what, that explains what's going on for me. That explains it. Uh, I would ask that you raise your hand in Zoom and my co-hosts are going to, um, to see you and then to um, unmute one or two so we can, we can hear from you. My, my experience is more towards moving from a waterfall mindset to an agile mindset where everybody's okay. in, in very, very typically waiting. Oh, oh, the, you know, for instance, the user story needs to be d written before I can work on my SDD or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Versus like, you know, like the typical example you gave of a relay, like you hand the button yeah. to the other person and that's when they start running. Yeah. So I think my, my example is coming simply from that mindset shift that I still have to make. Right. In terms of collaborating. Yes, and in the in waterfall environments, we definitely identified who does what, right? Yes. And it became a relay. That was one particular way to organize, but now we're moving to Agile and people still have a lot of that going on, right? Yes. I'm a designer, I design. Don't ask me to test stuff, even though that's Mm -hmm. unreasonable, but maybe it's not the best investment of my time and so on. And people go, you know, they do this mental gymnastics of why should they not collaborate, right? And that's like why I was saying that what, what I'm sharing with you now is really um, a set of filters, mental filters, and they all have to say yes, 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 before we will actually collaborate. Okay, let's move to the third one. The, thir the third one, the third prerequisite is that we can expect the other person or persons to make valuable contributions and be there to the end. Again, I'm gonna give you a positive example and a negative example. So the positive example is here on the slide. So that's me and my, my buddy at the race. In the race, the teams are two. They're never three or one or four, they're two. It's the same person, 50 hours over a really, really long weekend um, doing the craziest challenges imaginable. Um, we don't race with just anyone. So I picked this guy because I think that together we can be successful. Um, I believe that he has skills that complement mine and he picked me for the same reason. So um, it's not just about the theory of, you know, collaboration is good. It's collaboration with this individual because this individual brings a lot to the table and will be there to the end. Let's look at the negative example. Back-end development and front-end development, right? How often does it happen that you have teams where you have people who only do back end and people who only do front end, it could also be database, could be architecture, could be DevOps, and they really believe that the other person can work with them. They believe that everybody can do their part, but they can't even 
uh, rely on the fact that other people will be available for them, right? So, so for instance, the backend devs will do the tasks that are theirs, and each task will take however long it takes. Meanwhile, people who do front end do things on their time, and those things take their own time. And so it's really difficult to even coordinate any type of working together. Even if you put them in the same space and they all sit together, that's, by the way, going to be prerequisite number nine, the whole co-location thing. It's not about that. It's about can I work together with, with these, other, these other people? Okay, four. The thing that we always hear about and talks about Agile, safety. In this particular case, what does that mean? It means that during the collaboration itself, well, let's say it's pair programming, let's say we're writing a document together, we're doing a design workshop. During that activity, I can afford to be vulnerable. I can say things that turn out to be stupid. I can ask questions that might make me seem not terribly smart. I can afford to be vulnerable. But there's also what happens after, right? What happens after when somebody asks the other person, well, how did it go with Gil, right? How was that? So will the other person really be honest about my contribution? So I wanna give you a counter example from long, long ago when I was managing a team. I inherited this team and there were two people on it who really did not like each other. It boiled down to, boiled down to respect. They, the, each one was convinced that the other person was not respecting them. And even after we cleared the air and they agreed, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's fine and we're okay and we respect each other and whatever, they still didn't really want to work together much because they didn't trust that, um, that they could be vulnerable and that afterwards the other person wouldn't run to me as the manager and complain. So th that was that situation, okay? So there was definitely not enough safety. Now there's one more thing, this is number five. We might have safety, but we could be lacking fairness, okay? Fairness isn't the words that people often discuss when, when they talk about Agile, but it's definitely there, right? You can't just go from individuals doing stuff to teams and expect everybody to be totally cool with it, that there do need to be some conditions in place and fairness is one of them. Now you can see this um, in recent years, right? Leaders have learned to credit teams, right? So if something really important or useful happened, leaders will credit teams, they do that. And sometimes they will also recognize, you know, standout contribution. That's really important to do. Um, I wanna give you though a counter example, also with leaders, in this case, the leaders are teachers. So I have twins, they're finishing 11th grade. And two years ago, uh, my son was taking chemistry and like, teachers and, and the sciences often do, they had uh, work to do in pairs, right? So the assignments were supposed to be done in pairs. And my son, he picked a friend and they worked together. They had three weeks for the chemistry thing. Um, in a weekend, he comes to me and says, you know, my, my friend isn't doing anything. And he's like, what do I do? Uh, so I gave him some advice and this and that and nothing worked. But eventually I said, you know, okay, you're gonna get a grade out of this, so might as well try to get a good one. He did, he got a 95 and he was mad. He was mad because his friend who to the end did almost nothing at all, also got a 95. Now this is kids in school, right? But I can tell you that, you know, they're still in the same class, but they no longer work together. I mean, they're still friendly with each other, right? But um, in terms of doing work together, no incentive at all, no reason. Those conditions are not met anymore, okay? Because his friend effectively blew it. Um, and in addition, the teachers who actually knew about this gave him the same grade. Okay, so just to summarize, you guys have the handout. So what, what we've done so far, you need to have compelling reasons. You need those reasons to be uh, conducive for collaboration and not just cooperation. You need to assume valuable participation. You need to have safety, you need to have fairness. You also need to enjoy each other's company. You don't need to be, you know, awesome friends. You don't need to love each other, uh, but you do need to kind of look forward to the experience of working together, okay? Um, maybe you have no reason to, um, maybe you don't have evidence yet, but you at least have reason to believe that it would be positive. Uh, or if you've had past bad experiences, like my son did with his friend, um, maybe there's willingness to get past that. 
Um, again, as a positive example of that, we see a lot in terms of companies hiring for fit, right? And really making the work environment fun and comfortable so people do enjoy each other's company, right? The matter of fit, right? I mean, it's cultural fit. It also, it means we have more in common, we're more likely to enjoy being with each other. Um, I wanna give you a negative example for that. Again, something from um, my personal experience. Uh, one other thing I really, really like doing is solving puzzles. Four years ago, my wife and I discovered a puzzle convention. There's a thing like that where for 50, no, about 70 hours, people do nothing but solve puzzles. Word puzzles, not jigsaw, but word and logic and math. And most of the action happens even after midnight. Don't get me started, but it's all clean. Um, so one day I'm there. I'm seeing, you know, there's 200 people here. They're smart. I could learn from them. All the other prerequisites are met. And then somebody breaks out a puzzle. It's like after midnight, somebody breaks out the puzzle set and says, okay, this is meant to be solved together. Find a buddy. I said, wow, what an opportunity. I can solve with somebody else who may not necessarily join me otherwise, right? Because they're told to join people. And let's see, I could learn from this. So sure enough, we sit down and we start solving and we definitely make more progress than I would have on my own. This is working out. 20, 30 minutes in, I noticed that it's not. I noticed that while we're making progress, I am not liking the experience whatsoever. The guy had the charisma of a two by four, um, didn't really seem to recognize my, my participation there, uh, didn't try to make any eye contact, any, any, any human connection. So even though I was, you know, getting my cognitive muscles in use, this was not fun. So throughout the rest of the convention, there were many other opportunities to solve together. I stayed away from him. So the same thing can happen in your teams, right? Um, if you inherit a team or people come and go and so on, this is important, right? We like to believe that if people are professional, you know, um, you know, they are, you know, accomplished and, and we hire them for the skills and they're good and, and they, they, they're committed and the vision and blah, 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 but they may not actually like their particular colleagues. Now, before we move on, I, I would like again to see if um, anybody is saying, you know what, what, what I've seen so far, that's enough to explain why people are not collaborating or I am. And if so, please raise your hand and uh, we'll unmute you. So you, Katerina, you Katerina or Moreno? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hang on. I can put my video on as well. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah, it definitely does make sense. And maybe just to add that I think specifically given that we're now on number six, for example, um, that explains sometimes when you're newly coming into a team, that okay. might explain the history of why people now don't want to be lo working together. Um, yes. Because something might have happened in the past and as um, yes. the project manager or leader or whatever, you need to be attuned to also understanding the broad time scale of those yeah. experiences. Yeah, and, and willingness to get past them is not always a given, right? Yeah, okay. Let's move on. Number seven. Number seven, people are willing to collaborate. They also need to be able to co-create the experience. What does that mean? It means that the actual mechanics, the setup, the logistics, the how do we do this, should, we, should be up to them. Um, what you're seeing here on the slide, that is an agile leadership team that I coached long ago. And really what they were doing here is deciding who does what. Okay, so it's like a roles and responsibilities type of thing. There was also a picture earlier on where I showed you uh, five BAs who were mobbing. Now, mobbing is a thing in the Agile community. I was their coach. I could have told them, I could have invited them. I could say, hey, look up mob programming and see how it's done. None of that happened. Instead, there was, um, there was a story to work on and one of the guys, basically the more outspoken one said, why don't we just do this together? Seriously, that's how he said it. And everybody else said, uh, sure. <laughs> so he found the room and they went to the room. And a couple of minutes later, somebody said, uh, we're gonna need a laptop to look stuff up. So he went and fetched the laptop. That was it. That was it, right? They created their experience. They did not seek permission. They did not try to follow some mold or anything. It was simply, let's just do this. And they loved it. All I did for them as a coach is at the end, I asked them to debrief. So this doesn't become like a temporary thing, but they actually learn from it for better or worse. Okay, number eight, 
Collaboration involves people working together. Emotional intelligence is necessary, right? Because stuff can go south. Um, a positive example I can give you for that um, also comes from my race. And but I, use, I know this is not quite agile, but the um, but this is a prime example in my mind because you put two people in a stressful situation, they're not necessarily family, um, and all sorts of things can happen. In, in that race is so challenging, there have been meltdowns. Uh, people scream at each other. Uh, they get into disagreements. There's time pressure. Um, the prizes are actually pretty good. I mean, it's a charity event, but like really good prizes and so on. There's a lot of competitiveness. So, um, you know, knowing what I know about collaboration, um, I, um, I invited my buddy, uh, the first time we did this, and we've been doing it since, two weeks before the race, we go for a walk, and then we stop at Starbucks, and we say, what are our team agreements? How will we handle meltdowns? How will we handle disagreements? How will we handle such and such questions that might challenge us? Uh, how will we approach other team members, um, other racers, whatever? So we're prepared. We're prepared for things that might uh, question our patience. Uh, we're prepared for things that will surprise us, and we might answer less than, um, you know, or respond less than perfectly. Now, for the last one. Agile is not about collocation. And collocation is not a necessary condition for collaboration. It's great if you can have it, but if people don't get along and some of the other conditions I talked about are not met, collaboration will actually make things worse. So for instance, the two people I described who were on my, my team who, um, had this you know, safety issue, uh, they saw each other every day. We were in an open space. So um, imagine if they had been in different rooms and working on their own tasks, it would be less, there would be less friction. So it's not so much about the co-location. What human beings need, and everybody can, can feel this now that we're all working from home, is we need possibility of rapport. So rapport is when we really communicate to each other that we're, you know, we're, we're enjoying this exchange, we're enjoying being together. We usually do this subconsciously simply by, you know, how we stand and, and the pace of our speech and, and intonation and like uh, kind of going like this a little bit with the head and, and so on. And now we can only see each other on screen. Um, so that makes it even more difficult. But even if we're in the same space, um, we need to have that possibility, which is why cubicles are usually a bad idea for that, okay? Um, if you can have decent technology that allows people to create rapport, that's really good. Um, so for instance, I, I think Zoom became particularly popular, not just because it's free. Skype is also free, but Skype is terrible for rapport because it lags and hangs and it's slow and, and it's just horrible where Zoom is relatively frictionless. So um, for instance, I can see some of you now and I can see you nodding and, and so on. And it's with a relatively uh, brief lag after I speak. So it kind of feels like we're together. You need that effect in a team. So it's not just about the open plan, the open space, all of this, it's not it, okay? You simply need people to have the possibility of rapport. So there's that. Before we go to the deterrence, um, any questions? If you have anything to ask or comment, uh, raise your hand. Sarika. Gil, I had a question on uh, when it's okay, like you collaborate well, but the perspective is the half glass empty and the other glass half full. So if I have gone new to a team, I see things as half full. So I'm like extremely enthusiastic. We can make this happen. Okay. Whereas people who are already been working with that stakeholder know the reality and they're like, the glass is actually half empty. So their enthusiasm is not there. And even though we collaborate, we never seem to kind of have the same perspective on approaching the, the final stakeholder or the customer. Yeah. So what I would say is if you think about those nine prerequisites, think about them again in the sequence I gave you, because sometimes what you'll see is uh, people stop short already at number one. They just don't see a good reason to collaborate, period. Now, maybe, as I think you're saying, the reason is historic, right? Mm -hmm. We tried it, it didn't work. Or, yeah. uh, so this is what you would have to work on. Later on in the stock, I'm going to get to the process. And then it, um, in that process, you will see actually um, if the problem is systemic or it is personal. 
Okay, we, thank you. address them differently. Okay, uh, does anybody else have a question or a comment or a, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Now, before I get into the deterrence, I want to say a few things about them. Uh, there are six of them. They're in, they're in the list, but the list is not sequential the way the conditions were. Even if all the conditions are met, something, one of those six or more, might happen and discourage people from collaborating. Now, it doesn't prevent it altogether. So it's a, it's a discourage, it's a deterrent. Um, people might collaborate regardless. This is when, though, leaders come in, right? So some of what I'll share with you is really due to how leaders act. But definitely all of them are on leaders to address. Okay, so again, as I read through them uh, and explain them, uh, reflect if this is kind of somehow explaining what you're seeing, like because you, you picked an example earlier on. Let's look at one of, one of them: how we describe the work. So when you describe work, you can talk about what needs to be done, activities or inputs. You can talk about what we deliver, right? so deliverables, right, the outputs from the work. And you can also talk about outcomes, right? So how we make a difference. All of these are important. But the question is, in your team, in your situation, does work get described in such a way that implies that we might as well or better work alone? It implies that specialization is critical or that other people don't really have enough to contribute to justify collaboration. I want to give you three examples that I see a lot. One of them is the typical definition of done. Most, okay, I'm going to say all the teams I've ever met, when you look at their definition of done, it's basically a list of activities that got done. I'm sure there are people here who have different examples, but this is what I've seen. I, I usually get called in when things are not hunky dory, right? So definitions of done, coded, tested, code reviewed, fixed, documented. Let's put aside for a moment the fact that, you know, your workflow should communicate this, so the definition of done looking like that is not even necessary. It's just about the activities. It's not about the, the state of the deliverable. It does, a definition of done like this does not communicate that we're jointly responsible for, the, for that deliverable. We just need to make sure that some activities take place. Uh, here's another example of wh where this plays out. Functional tasking. Again, I do front end, you do back end, somebody else does automation, somebody else will do the data migration, and so on. It's all divided functionally, so the, the implication is just do your bit. Okay. And third is the daily stand-up. The traditional form of the daily stand-up, the one that everybody knows and many teams still do, think about it. <clears throat> what have you done since yesterday? What are you planning to do today? <clears throat> What's in your way? Not outcomes. <clears throat> if we're good, those are outputs. Okay. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit. The traditional form of the stand-up actually is even worse because everything about it is I and me, not we. So th there's definitely that element. Um, that's why I really like when, you know, the daily stand-up uh, is more the Kanban style or more about the outcome, which is basically, you know, planning what, what's the best plan we can come up with for the next 24 hours? And when you ask it like that, it's, it's a team responsibility. Or when you look, you know, when you walk the board right to left and so on, you're looking at finishing and reaching done and so on, which is um, definitely more communicating of, you know, we're, we're responsible for this together. <clears throat> Second deterrent, kind of related. Your tools, your processes might send subtle messages and make hidden assumptions. Uh, my favorite, or not, is the one on the bottom left, which I'm sure 99% of you would recognize as JIRA. Uh, <clears throat> if I had a dollar for every time I was with a team and we talked about collaboration and somebody said, but Gil, we can't tell JIRA there's two people working on it. There's the SINE field that takes one person. I could get myself a pretty good meal just, just with that dollar, right? Um, and people bend over backwards 
to customize GRS so it's possible, but I can tell you what's worse. The too many teams don't even bother. They just say, okay, that's just the tool. Okay, well, we'll just, okay, we'll just have a single SINE. Uh, some people do the same with their sticky notes, right? So the stuff, uh, the example on the top right, right? A Kanban board that is not about the service, it is not about the team, it's about what is each individual doing. And I already mentioned the three questions and it's all I, 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 right? What did I do? What will I do? Related to the I, who is accountable for stuff, okay? If you ever go to stand-ups and you hear stuff such as, oh, I have a lot on my plate. The very existence of plates should say something. Or people say, my part is done, okay? Yeah, I've done the front end, it's good, solid, tested it. My part is done, and uh -huh, I'm done here. So this kind of behavior doesn't really help us. Now, it's not that people are evil. They actually mean well when they say these things. The system that they inhabit emphasizes individual accountability, do your work, right? You know what your work is, and that should be good. Um, the picture on the right, credits from a movie. I don't know if they collaborate on movies, but my experience with producers and such is that they don't really. Uh, and again, everybody has a role. Um, the picture on the left, that one always gives me a kick. So, you know, I live in Toronto um, where we have leaves, we have snow, there's always stuff to clear. And this actually is on my street. And like, I, I, could, I actually watched a crew one day uh, clear the leaves from the grass of the house on the left. Uh, I mean, of course, they have the money to spend on this. The crew finished, left it like that. I took a picture, and it, but it was a windy day. So within five minutes, leaves blew over from the other house and messed up their work, but the crew doesn't care. It's not their problem. They're not paid to deal with the next lawn. And the way, you know, we kind of tr treat our property is, you know, we take care of our own. Right? We don't necessarily you know, uh, connect with our neighbors and say, hey, you know what, why don't we get the, uh, the cleanup crew to clean both lawns? And, and again, I think the default is that people just don't try. Right? It's not that they can't, it's totally doable, but it doesn't occur to them and they don't try. So by the same token, my part is done. Right? Uh, related to that, a very common deterrent and something that actually um, I hear about a lot more these days with the work from home and the corona is that people are doing way too much work now, way more than they used to do uh, over time and whatever. But what happens as a result? When we have too much whip, people are tempted or sometimes told to uh, split up and work on their own, right? I mean, if you put two people on a task, you better get some benefit out of that. Higher quality, faster finish, uh, fewer mistakes, those are actually pretty hard to predict or justify. Anybody who's an agile coach justifies them for a living, but um, we can't really prove this. And in some cases it's actually false because not everything justifies collaboration. So people fall back on individual work. I have a client right now in the Toronto area. People, if they used stickies, that's what the people would look like because they're so busy and I can tell you there's no collaboration going on there now. They, they have a deadline and that's what they're trying to hit. Another deterrent, very much on the human side of Agile. Having clicks. So this is when you have a team, doesn't matter how many people, but let's say five, 10. Some of them are like a sub team, right? So a click is basically like a sub team. Now, quite often, these are the people who got recruited from the same company, or they are the initial members of the team, or they went to school together, or they hang out together after work and whatever. And, and I love it when people are friends. Um, what I don't necessarily like is when that excludes others because they just don't hang with the others, okay? So that, that is an exclusionary behavior. Uh, the headphones. So back when we had offices uh, and we would actually go to them, uh, we, uh, we would see people with headphones on. Nothing wrong with that. I love hearing my music, gets me into good flow. Uh, when I was programming for a living, I had headphones on all the time. Um, but what happens if people have their headphones on longer than they really need to? Think about it. 
right? I mean, you could put your headphones on and that basically communicates to others, don't interrupt me. And what I like is when people, when, when teams have agreements as to um, when we can have them on and when not, when we want to be, you know, focusing on our own thing and, and flow and don't interrupt me and that's okay, just have an agreement about this. But what typically happens is teams don't have the agreement and they use the headphones as a signal. And, and the third one here is the matter of the language. Um, so again, I live in Toronto. It's pretty unusual to find a team that does not have people who speak more than one language. Um, most technical teams here, there's seven, eight languages. And I, I'm going to say this as somebody who came to Canada as an immigrant, as you know, many people here and many people you know, and I can tell you that speaking my, my mother tongue, which uh, <laughs> only a handful of million of people at work, um, in the world speak, th that's huge. That's huge. And so whenever I'm around somebody who, who speaks that language, I am tempted to, to speak it. And I know it excludes others. I know it does. And it's, it's a habit that's really hard to kick. But that's why I was saying that this is really all about, you know, it's on leaders because leaders, I believe, have the perfect right to say, when you're doing teamwork, use only English or French, whatever, but use just one language because we don't want to exclude people. So there's that. Uh, before we continue to our process, there is this sixth deterrent, which is the biggest deal. A lot of people talk a lot about collaboration and a lot of people really like it, but do they actively, truly, intentionally value it is the question here. And what do I mean by that? When we operate, when we do work, a handful of values guides us. You know, I do a lot of work on mindset, right? I wrote the book called The Agile Mindset and whatever. Um, there's values, there's beliefs, there's principles. Beliefs are a narrative. Principles, there's plenty. But values are a short list. They're a really short list. Um, and we typically operate with just a handful. If collaboration is not on that list, other things will be more important to us, such as hitting deadlines, such as efficiency, such as satisfy the customer at all costs. And when that happens, it's gonna be extra difficult to encourage people to collaborate because it might come at the expense of something. So if you wanna have collaboration, you need to truly value collaboration. And if that value is in contradiction with something or even partial contradiction, you'll want to be very explicit and very intentional about what you want. So for instance, when people work on their own, we can sort of predict dates, we do estimation and all of that. Never mind if that's viable or not, but people try. And for some work, it's, it, it really is viable. But when people work together, it's much harder. It's really harder to assess productivity or estimate it and so on. Uh, when people collaborate, especially when they're still learning to collaborate. And so you need to be ready for this. And that means valuing it potentially over some other things. I'll give you an example. I have a client in Toronto. It's a national organization, so I'm, I'm not going to name them, uh, but you all know them. And um, they decided uh, about two years into Agile, that was four years ago, they decided um, to really identify their values and they came up with three. Uh, collaboration, learning, and improvement. So notice that collaboration is there. Learning is there. That one became a learning organization. It became an organization obsessed with improvement and always doing better and being data-driven, but they also collaborate. It's hard, they're not there yet, but they are explicit about it. And at one of the uh, last um, road mapping meetings that I, um, that I facilitated, uh, the person in charge of the department told him, he told everybody present, um, I don't know what we'll do in five years, but I can tell you this, that collaboration will matter more than dates. He said this in an organization that is otherwise pretty preoccupied with dates. So that, that was how he was creating the environment. Okay. I wanna tie this up together in a process for you. Um, before we do this, 
if you didn't get the download, the handout when we started, again, that's the link. It's at the beginning of the chat, I believe. And if not, um, one of my co-hosts will uh, put the download there. Um, when you go to that page, uh, you'll also see you know, that there's an opportunity if you want to get some more of my writings or more of my resources, um, you can sign up there. Um, so, so there's that. Before we get to the process, is there any question or comment about the deterrence? Natasha. And maybe maybe you'll cover this sort of in the next step, but just back to that sort of value of collaboration and measuring. Okay. Um, some metrics, some sort of, because when you, once you sort of go higher up in leadership, it's, yeah. it's a nice idea, but it's harder to sort of maybe measure or kind of show the value or show the output, it feels a little fluffy. And, and it totally <laughs> is. It totally is. And, and here's the thing. Again, going to mindset, one of the elements of mindset is beliefs. Do the people you talk to believe that if you can't measure it, it's bad for you? That might be the case. They might frame it differently. But a lot of people say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't see it, you can't manage it. There's some variation there. Right. And I fully believe that collaboration is not quite measurable. I mean, you, you can measure instances when you collaborate. You can measure the inputs to collaboration. But can you measure the outputs? Presumably, you can. Defects escaping to production, um, engagement, motivation, um, code quality, technical debt, presumably you can. But let me tell you, no um, organization that I'm aware of ever adopted collaboration because of metrics. Right. It adopted collaboration because the people in charge were convinced that it beats solo work. As simple as that. Now, guys, think about it. Um, some activities don't justify collaboration. Okay, one example I, I think about is when we moved house, four people showed up to move our house. Technically, two could have shown up. In terms of uh, labor hours, might have been, you know, proportional. But do four people create more magic when moving furniture than two do? Probably not. But two can do a lot more than one can, right? Like heavy furniture, awkward stuff, and so on. So you do need to kind of tailor this to what you have going on. Anybody who's in software development, that usually benefits from a whole bunch of brains on the job, okay? Other activities, it varies. It definitely varies. Um, I think we have another hand, Sigrun? Hi, Gil, thank you. Yeah, um, my question is more around, like uh, if you have to choose between training your team or your organization on being, customer faced or valuing collaboration. I don't think you can do both at the same time. Customer facing or collaborative. So those are the two you're comparing? Yeah, because you mentioned earlier about, um, about like what, what do you value more, right? Do you value more satisfying your customer at all costs or having your team collaborate? But what if your, your team isn't even seeing the benefit of actually being customer facing on, on like providing value to your clients. Right. So look, they're not entirely independent, but you can work on them separately, right? So you can have a team and maybe the team doesn't even get the concept of a customer, but through experiences, they realize that working together gets them better results. Now you and I would say, well, probably the results should be uh, meaningful to customers. Fair enough you can also look at that. But you, I, so I believe you can amplify things um, there, uh, indif independently. In Agile, we try to do both. We actually try to you know, go after you know, pretty big package all at the same time. And, and that does work. Um, if you have a team that's uh, not quite there yet, you might need to be more gradual. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Let's look at, you know, the process for making collaboration happen. So what, what I actually covered with you was, you know, a good chunk of what you need, uh, but now we're going to see it, you know, as, as a full process. So 
the first two steps I'm going to cover together and then we're going to put you in, in breakout rooms again for just three minutes um, to sharpen um, those steps for you. So the first thing you need is to define your goals and parameters for collaboration. So I'll give you an example on the next slide here. You can decide that you want collaboration because it spreads the knowledge. You can decide that you want collaboration because it increases quality or because it advances the culture. So this is all great stuff. Just decide what it is, right? Don't get collaboration for collaboration's sake or because it sounds like a good thing, right? Because people will buy in or be motivated once they know the purpose for it, okay? So Sigrun, that might actually also help a little bit with your question. And then what are your parameters for it? Because you're not gonna have it all the time, right? And like we said, there needs to be balance. So how often, when, on what kinds of work? Um, just as an example, um, <laughs> way back when, same team where uh, I had the two people who didn't get along, we did everything, that was like 2002. We were doing extreme programming, doing everything ourselves. Wonderful, one day I stayed in and I was testing a, um, a data migration script and around 5.30 I realized that I was testing it in production. Okay, so I had to stay until seven and kind of you know put stuff back and uh, make sure that everything is cool and so on. And the next day we said, okay, nobody touches the database alone. Okay, so we did not have full collaboration at that point, but we said, you know, if you touch the database, you're not alone. Okay, and we actually structured a, a team agreement around that. So that was an example of, you know, the first case for collaboration with some very specific parameter around it. Also, is it optional? Do people get to choose if yes or no? Uh, and if they do, how do they do that? Right. Step two was to actually go through, and you should have this on your handout as well, uh, to identify specific situations where you'd like to see it. So earlier, an hour ago, I asked you to pick an example that you would work with. You can use the same example now. So we're going to put you in the breakout rooms and uh, the instructions for the breakout room are in the Google Doc. It's basically the slide. Um, so I, I just want you to kind of fine tune your, your choices because uh, then when I take you through steps three, four, and five, um, you, you will, can actually do you know, the mental work with a specific example with specific outcomes. So uh, let's open the rooms. <clears throat> Ooh, the Malt Mafia, that's a nice room name. <laughs> yeah, I took the liberty of uh, coming up with some crazy names. <laughs> I almost had to settle for a mullet because this haircut is new. <laughs> yeah. Now maybe they have uh, good reasons to collaborate. So that's condition one. Oh, and they value each other's contribution, but the tester doesn't feel safe around one of the devs and that dev doesn't feel treated fairly. And, so, and maybe a third dev is all for collaboration, but has trouble handling stressful exchanges. So. Um, you know, an example like this would, would, would help you understand that they are in different places, right? Different prerequisites are unmet for them. So when you do this type of, you know, mental assessment, which I'm not going to ask you to share, right? But I, it, it should be fairly quick for you to do. If you're seeing, seeing patterns or consistency, you have a system issue to fix. Okay, mm -hmm. or to address. I want to give you three examples from my clients. Um, so there was one client I, I was asked to come in and, you know, coach them on product development. I could tell, and, and basically, you know, many teams there told me, work was broken down by specialty so much. And people really smart, really capable. They did not have a good reason to collaborate. So the, the condition, the prerequisite that was unmet for most people was the first one. Uh, another example where it was the second one, uh, I was working with the media company and I was working with a bunch of the uh, movie producers and show producers and such. The producers were friendly, collaborative, smart. They went back years. They were motivated to join forces, but only for backup not for collaboration. Producing is very much a, you know, one person type of thing for them. Uh, I don't want to make a general statement. I don't know that field well enough. Um, but it, it was very much about, you know, who the producer is on show X and anybody else who happens to know what's going on on show X, that's backup. 
So for them, the unmet was uh, the second pre um, prerequisite. Uh, third one, an example that I'm sure many of you will, um, uh, will recognize. Um, an investment firm, in this case, with IT and business. POs from the business don't think that the IT teams know enough to make meaningful contributions. So while the business people collaborate among themselves and the IT folks collaborate among themselves, they do not cross the lines because they just don't think that they can make valuable contributions. So any type of you know, cross-role collaboration, which is so basic and agile, that just wouldn't happen. It took years to change, and even then it was very much um, you know, specific to situations. Um, is anybody here you know, it, it, doing this type of mental assessment and saying, yeah, I'm seeing a pattern, and I know exactly which one it is, and you would like to share? Sumiti. Hi. The third one that you just said so, so, so applies, <laughs> you know, in my case, in terms of silos being created. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of an anti pattern to agile. It's kind of a joke to say, you know, uh, tell us the requirements, but they say it's with the business. Then you say, what's the solution? And IT says it's with us. You know, don't yes. ask what we implemented. So we're kind of in that tussle at the moment. You know, yes. where there is more, you know, execution driven than collaboration driven that, you know, think of ideas, brainstorm. Okay. So, right. So execution driven also has to do with what you value, right? You know, just do stuff and be busy and finish and here's a plan and go do it. So that's definitely one of them. But the other, the other is we can't just go to them and say, you know, we're agile, so we need to collaborate, right? Because if that prerequisite is not being met, you have a, a systemic issue. The systemic issue in this case could well be that... They just don't un, um, know each other well enough and, and don't know each other's skill set well enough and um, simply limit themselves. So that's sort of uh, what I would um, consider. Uh, would anybody else um, have a pattern or consistency to share? Okay, so that takes us to step five. Because in step five, you're looking for, again, those numbers, so to speak. And, and if you're seeing disparity, you have an individual, a personal uh, matter to address. Again, I want to give you two examples from my clients. Um, one of them, uh, they were multiple teams doing, you know, pretty heavy duty software development, cutting edge, new technologies, great stuff, great people. One particular team, they were doing the thing that was uh, most user facing, uh, definitely very challenging, um, you know, high performance, high availability, this and that. For everybody on that team, all the prere <coughs> prerequisites were met. They wanted to collaborate and they did, except the architect. The architect there stopped short at the first one. The architect there <coughs> did not believe that there was any point in having other people also do architecture. I mean, she kind of paid lip service to it in conversations, uh, but realistically, she produced the architecture on her own and everybody else was grumbling because they wanted to be part of it. And there was really no good reason, as far as I, I was concerned, to assume that they couldn't uh, participate. So that was definitely a personal issue that was happening there. Uh, the other example I want to give you is, um, I mean, it, it, you might think it's a little bit comical because it's not technically about work, it's about learning. Um, so I teach agile engineering courses where people really learn how to be agile developers, not just you know, devs doing Scrum. And so there's labs and people code together. I want them learning together, pairing up so they learn from each other and solve together. And between activities, they switch partners. In every course I teach, there will be some people who, when they hear, okay, find new buddies, they stay put. They wait for other people to join them. Whereas everybody else gets up and looks for the new partner, they don't. They wait for others to join them. And I can tell from the body language that if nobody did join them, they wouldn't mind it. So it's really all on their own terms, okay? Now, it's a short course, it's a learning environment. I, I do have conversations with them, but I don't bug them because I want them learning and, and not you know, putting up fights. But this is another example of how um, 
there is disparity in how much, uh, to what extent people are willing to collaborate. Uh, so um, again, I would like to open this to uh, anybody who would like to share and, and um, you know, you can see how to apply step five or you want to ask me anything about it. Alon. Yes, um, I have a question. I'm not entirely sure if it completely relates, but let's see. Um, <laughs> so we have a situation where uh, we have a team who really wants to do things by themselves. Uh, we also have uh, a very senior principal engineer who is really interested in helping and we want them to, we want him to help um, and and what, one of the difficulties is the moment this person walks into into a conversation everyone else is like okay uh, God has spoken uh, now that's not his that's not his intention I know the guy he really really is really open to, uh, to collaboration and listening to everyone and very open to new ideas. Uh, okay. It's really not just about him. Um, but just by definition, by having a hierarchy of some sort, uh, it immediately propagates into the team. Yeah, but it's, it does sound like, you know, this is really a case of step five. There is disparity, right? What that person wants to, uh, that person's, perspective on collaboration is different from the rest of the teams. Okay. Okay. So, so I would ask you, where do you think you have more potential by coaching him or by coaching the team? Why, why would you say that, um, that he has a different way of looking at collaboration than the team? Um, because re really all, all we're trying to do is we're trying to get him into the meetings. Mm -hmm. And I can see resistance from the team, to, actually for, from the manager of the team, because okay. he's like saying, well, you know, uh, we bring him in and the moment he's in the room, everyone else will be more quiet. People will not share as much because they will kind of wait for him to give the answers. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe that is the person to coach. In other words, what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing here is that it's not a system issue, right? It's a personal issue. Right? Yep. And sometimes it's what's, what people tell themselves. It's also what they tell others about other people. Mm. Right? And so um, it may actually be a very simple situation here, but there is at least three different entities, right? The manager, the individual, and the team that, that, that need a conversation to take place. And, and those conversations would probably be different. Absolutely. Right? It's, yeah. it's, it's not a systemic thing such as uh, we reward people based on individual accomplishments and so they are not motivated to collaborate. Mm -hmm. right? Or we give them um, you know, old school performance appraisals and if they don't meet their own goals but instead they help others, they get thanked for that. That's a systemic thing. Okay. okay. So after you do this, Right. Remember, the, the, the prerequisites have to be met first, but then there, there's some potential deterrence, right? So I would ask them in, in step six to look at those various deterrents and see if any of these uh, are actually happening there, right? If, are you actually, uh, you personally or your leadership, uh, doing anything that deters people uh, from collaborating? Um, and, and one of the deterrents, right? Uh, let's actually put the, uh, the list back. One sec. Uh, no, where is it? Here. Okay. One of the deterrents, number one. So, for instance, Alon, for your question, maybe the the work that these people do is only described in terms of activities and outputs, and there is no attempt to look at the bigger picture, the outcomes. Maybe that's the case. Maybe this is something that's just how we roll. Okay, so that could be it. Uh, again, another one could be collaboration, just not being explicitly and authentically valued. And we heard this, um, you know, one of the earlier people who spoke, you know, talk, said that it's a lot about execution. And valuing execution is not bad, but once you value something, you might be valuing other things less. 
right? And people do have to, to make choices. By the way, about values, um, this is not entirely, you know, something from this talk, but um, one of the most important and actually easy things to do that few companies ever do is be intentional about their values. Because every company has values, but they're often implicit. They're often just, you know, here's how we do stuff around here. And you can kind of reverse engineer the values from the behaviors. But if you want any change, you have to be explicit. You have to be intentional. And some of your choices might contradict others and you have to choose. You have to choose. Okay. Uh, the last point I want to make here is that uh, Rome was not built in a day, especially this particular Rome of collaboration. And you, you are going to have to prioritize your efforts. So for instance, the team I worked with, when we said, you know, don't touch the database alone, that took a little bit of getting used to. Um, we didn't necessarily try a lot more, but that alone was huge for us. Okay, so that was, that got us a step further. Uh, you know, there's so much these days about, you know, mobbing and, you know, collaboration and uh, across, you know, more than just two individuals. Um, you may not need to go there, or you may go there only after um, people have enough reference experience that, you know, doing this is, is good for them and good for the outcomes and that they um, feel good afterwards. And I also want to say something that is specific to this period in time. Um, I think that these days, with everybody work, working from home and all the context for that, um, collaboration is extra important for our sanity. Because then we're not alone. It's not just about, you know, being friendly and or, you know, having lunch over Zoom. It's also the, the feeling of accomplishment of, um, yeah, we did stuff together, despite the difference, uh, not the difference, the distance. Okay, so I think this is um, incredibly useful. Um, okay, so what else do we have here? Um, I'm more than happy to take uh, questions. Um, as I, I mentioned on the meetup, um, I teach agile leadership. Um, I don't certify. It's all based on my you know knowledge and experiences and the books. Uh, this is happening in two weeks, so there's already people from Vancouver. Um, there, it's three half days, uh, like three, four hours each day. Um, I do have, you know, quite a number of people in that class who are paying their own way. It is shocking how many companies have stopped investing in any type of um, learning or, you know, change. Uh, but people are paying their own way. So I do respect that. And that's why this is discounted. Um, so this is after, you know, the, the discount for Agile Vancouver plus the out-of-pocket. Uh, if you want to just get more of my writing, so I write uh, articles and guidance and newsletters like every two, three, sometimes four weeks. Uh, so that's where you can get that. Um, and of course, the books. Amazon is back to shipping books, which I really appreciate. So if you wanted them, you can get them uh, in print. And of course, there's the other forms as well. Uh, so that's it for me. My hosts, what do we do now? Thanks. Thanks so much, Gil. That was super interesting. Um, definitely, when you talked about the deterrence, there were uh, probably all of them that I noticed that I <laughs> had in my team before, to some okay. extent. Um, so I think people really um, can uh, f find this really valuable and will see and find this in their own organizations. Um, so I think for now, I first of all want to ask if there's any more questions um, that you didn't get to ask during Gil's talk. So we'll take some time for Q&A. So if there is anybody, please raise your hand. Just going to give people a little more time. Or just make a comment. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, or just tell us, tell us what you thought about it. Yeah. Share your experience if you want. Sishan, just unmute yourself. Yeah, just want to thank Gil. I think I'm going to walk away from this with a few things to experiment with my team, and I really appreciate that. All right. I have a question. All right. Hello, go ahead. Uh, I, I may have missed something, uh, but um, when you spoke about the daily stand-up and, um, and JIRA and the fact that you can assign only one person, mm -hmm. you suggested that both of them are kind of flawed in the way people think. Um, 
can you share with us what a good stand up should look like or how to uh, get around the jira thing <laughs> okay so what is a good stand up like a good stand up is collaborative it has people feel safe to participate a good stand up is focused on making progress right making progress is not just a matter of removing impediments that's just part of it um a good stand up is micro planning right so you have your big plan like release project whatever you also have sprint planning or if you do kanban then you know it's still short um short time period planning this is daily planning 24 hours now um one way i like to run it that is very simple and encourages conversation is to simply ask team what's the best thing we can do in the next 24 hours everybody's already looking at the plan okay so we don't need people to necessarily you know regurgitate tasks but what's the best thing we can do so you bring updates to that and you ask questions and so on and, and but but you don't you don't feed people so that's that um i like the kanban style of stand-up because it iterates over the work and not over the people Right, you look, you walk the board right to left, you, you look at what's close to finishing, you look at what's next and so on. You're very much focusing on finishing and getting work through the pipe as opposed to what are people busy with? Because what people are busy with is actually not interesting. Finishing and delivering stuff is. So that's that. Now, how to get around the JIRA. Um, a pattern that I really like, which of course is a bit challenged these days when people work from home, is that people have a physical board for just the sprint. So everything is still in JIRA, but we represent the current sprint, you know, just the headings on stickies. And on the stickies, you can do whatever you want. You don't need to create a fancy workflow in JIRA. You can do whatever you want on the board. That's easy, low cost of change, pretty trivial. And you keep JIRA up to date whenever. It could be daily, it could be once every two weeks. Um, so that's that. Otherwise, you do have to kind of um, customize JIRA to make it possible for you to, to identify more than one owner. Um, sometimes people will say, okay, so we'll put the name of somebody who takes ownership for the story and people might swap in and help out and whatever. But that, that is one form of getting the work done. It is not necessarily collaboration. So what I want people to do, and you know, this has been my thing, you know, since I started coaching 16 years ago is this define your process and then bring in a tool don't start with the tool and for and bend over backwards to make the tool happy that's a good point thank you so much you're welcome i'm happy to take more questions and comments folks Yo, i have a, i have a question that's pretty similar to alan's because you said okay. um Definition of done, like coded, finished, that's like very focused on the activities. What would yeah. be a better definition of done then? So you want to think about the deliverable and say, in what state would it, should it be in for us to put it to bed and move on? So for instance, you might say, um, instead of saying code reviewed, right? You can say um, at least two people have looked at a set of artifacts and are comfortable with them. Now, this is subjective. Okay. This is subjective, but you know, code reviewed is, is even more fluff, right? Because unless we actually define this in minute detail, who knows what that means, right? True. Um, <clears throat> right, in terms of um, fixed, don't say fixed, right? You can say, to the best of our understanding, the thing does not have any risky or embarrassing or reputation risking defects. I don't know, something like that. So you can tell, all right, we think it's good. It's not, we ran through 50 test cases or we uh, found eight bugs. The numbers don't matter. What does matter is, can we share the thing? Thank you. Uh -huh. I think Sigrun uh, raised right. her hand as well. Yes, I just wanted to second what you said earlier, Gil, um, about tools over processes, because what I'm, I'm telling in my organization is if you are not able to have a daily stand up and move your tickets with sticky notes on a piece of paper, there's no 
reason why you can do it with any kind of tool, Jira or TFS or whatever it is, right? And I find that is really challenging for people because they always think a tool is the answer, but it's not the tool, it's changing the behavior and the mindset, exactly what you said. Well, it's also because a lot of people <coughs> associate Agile with tooling <coughs> as opposed to a necessary thing, right? Sticky notes are tools, okay? <coughs> But a lot of people will think that Agile is a process. Agile is a set of best practices. Agile is a methodology. Agile is all of this supplemented by tools. And when, when this is the interpretation, you're not likely to get agility. That's actually the subject of the whole other talk that I'm giving tomorrow someplace else. But yeah, um, the, um, it's not that Agile is just a mindset either. Right? The mindset is not just how you make choices. The mindset is also, um, it also has implications in the real world. Now, <clears throat> actually, I'll show you here. So, okay, I'll have to turn on selfies so I can see what you guys are seeing. <clears throat> so here's a model. Okay, at the top is why we do the work. At the bottom is how we get stuff done. Mindset is in the middle. So it has values and beliefs. I mentioned this a couple times. But there's a level in between. There's a matter of principles, right? So Agile has principles such as collaboration, such as simplicity, such as transparency, safety, servant leadership, and so on. A lot of people honestly believe that Agile only lives here, right? Here's the form of it. We stand up every day. We write stories in a certain format from 20 years ago and, and blah, blah, blah. But no, it's about how we make choices, why we make the choices, and what specifically we do. So to me, you know, being agile is very much at this level and you implement it however is right for you. <clears throat> it's when you go from the bottom up that you get to trouble, right? Because you kind of get stuck in, with, with the framework. So what else can I do for you? Any other questions or comments? There was one of collaboration. Which one would you uh, would you pick? Hmm. Say that again, sorry. Um, if there was one metric of collaboration for you to pick from, which one would you recommend? How can we say if we're collaborating more or less than previously? Okay. If you're collaborating more or less, that's kind of easy to see because you can simply um, <clears throat> look at everything the team does, uh, task stories, whatever. And you can simply count or look at, you know, where did we work together? And you can ask people, was that really working together or just passing the, the work along? And, and you can compare that and you can see how this can grow, you know, from sprint to sprint. But if there is also a metric of, is this doing us any good? What I would go for, then again, it's in the sense of, it's, it's in my usual style of being subjective. It is once the deliverable is finished, ask the participants, the, the people who worked on it, <clears throat> how much better is this than if we had done it with handoffs? Just ask them. It can be like a Likert scale, right? Strongly agree, strongly disagree, something basic, right? Because there's really no... I don't know if any legitimate, you know, hard numbers way to measure this, right? I mean, you can measure defects in production, but even that, you know, it's, it's kind of lagging and there's, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, okay, I, you know, I, I mentioned puzzles. I do puzzles all the time. Seriously, I'm, I'm crazy that way. Anything I solve with my wife, I, I succeed more. We succeed more because there's stuff she sees that I don't and there's stuff that I see that she doesn't. And sometimes I get stuck and sometimes I misunderstand. And sometimes I need somebody to explain the thing to me because the instructions are there and I'm not getting it. So I can say that, you know, for those things, <clears throat> two minds are better than one. But I don't want to count finished puzzles. That's boring. Thank you. All right. So, uh, hi, I have one question you know, for the collaboration with mm -hmm. the Scrum teams. So we yep. have done this for a long time, you know, with cross-functional 
and work together. But in reality, we always have architects, we have database admin developers, QAs, devs. Okay. Yeah. So I think you mentioned about front and back end developers. So how to make them you know, collaborate and help each other in the team? So I would suggest <clears throat> first, you know, you follow the process that I set out because that will give you an idea of where to look. Maybe they want to collaborate with something that's preventing them from doing that. Okay, so that's one option. Uh, maybe they want to collaborate, but there is some difference, you know, that um, one is not feeling safe and another one is just, you know, not feeling the connection and so on. You, because you would address these differently. But when it comes to the matter of roles, we need roles. Roles make sense. Now, the thing is, what stories do people tell themselves about the roles? Okay, it's, I, I, I'll tell you, when I was an architect, software architect, I don't know, 18 years ago, I thought I was, you know, quite a hotshot. I thought that was a promotion, that was a big deal. I was doing important stuff. When you have people going around telling stuff like that to themselves, they're less likely to collaborate. Um, <clears throat> Look at the um, front end developers in your team or ask them just in conversation, okay? How do you think about your role? Okay, what is important to you? Uh, when does stuff happen that kind of bugs you? And <clears throat> you might hear stories such as, you know what, on our team, back end is the heavy lifting and front end is like the, you know, the, uh, the little brother. You might hear that. I don't know what type of work you do, but if you hear that, uh, you're hearing that there is a, um, a difference in perception and a difference in stature, and, and that really affects people. You might also hear that, you know, oh, you know, on the front end, we get to do the really cool stuff, you know, bleeding edge, uh, Angular 17, I don't know, whatever the version is now, uh, whereas on back end, eh, we just do the boring old stuff moving data around. And then people might say, well, why do you want to collaborate with me on that? Like, really? And because we're doing Angular 2000, uh, you cannot collaborate with me because this is so advanced, nobody knows it. So you might have that effect. Th that's why I, I, I really put this process together of you know, how to think about people collaborating because it's never about just encouraging people. It's never about just you know, convincing them that it's good. There's a lot going on. <clears throat> Look at this, nine conditions and six deterrents. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a big deal. But I'm sorry, that's just, I fully believe in this. That's just how I think it is. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, man. Looking at the time, um, we'll do one final question if there are any. Okay, I twist my arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about, um, I'm going to use a, a bit of a harsh word here, uh, forcing collaboration through environment or process? Good luck with that. Okay. Um, you cannot force people to collaborate. You can force compliance, okay? Mm a lot of people in the world, okay, we talked earlier about brutal honesty, right? Dougley and all of that. A lot of people in the world are compliant with Scrum because they've been told to, not because they want to. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are compliant with um, certain coding standards because a tool breaks the build if they don't. Not because they see value in it, right? but you cannot force people to collaborate with another human being. They will play nice and they'll look polite. And, um, and when you ask them, how did it go? They say, yeah, yeah, fine, it's all good, it's all good. It's the same as you know, asking people at the daily standup, uh, any impediments, and you hear no. And sometimes it's a legitimate no. <clears throat> and quite often it's, it's a false no because they're not feeling safe. And saying no is the best way they can get out of the situation. So Thank collaboration you. has to be legitimate. It has to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Sarika? Uh, 
I see Sarita, are you raised your hand? Can't hear you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. So in terms of role within the team, say for instance, Scrum Master, a BA, a developer, can a RACI be applied for all the team's efforts like prioritization of efforts, defining goals and parameters? Who owns this entire activity? Who, who will lead it? Who will initiate it? So, sorry, who will lead which activity? For example, prioritization of efforts. Ah, okay. So think about it this way. You can have a RACI matrix in your team. You can say, here is a list of responsibilities. Let's say there's 30, 40 of them. <clears throat> Here's who does what, who gets consulted and so on. That might be a legitimate starting point when you have a uh, team that's really used to traditional ways of working um, because it, it kind of gives them um, a bit of comfort. Um, on the flip side, on the other extreme, you can say we have a team, they're collaborating on anything, anything and everything. They're responsible for prioritizing. They're responsible for stakeholder communication. It doesn't mean that they all go as a group, right? It doesn't yeah. mean that when you need to talk to a stakeholder, everybody marches together down the hallway, there's no hallway anymore, and talks to the stakeholder. Yeah. It's not like that, but they decide who does what, including prioritizing the backlog, right? You need the, the backlog to be prioritized by somebody who can legitimately speak for the business, you know, has, you know, the respect of the team, can make the hard calls and so on. That does not even have to be a single person. Scrum says it does, but I've had teams where it was not because they could not make a single person work. So that team happened the other extreme. In the middle, you have a journey. So, I, uh, Janina, we, we also said we'll give people a little bit of time to network, maybe in the breakout rooms. How yeah. do we do this now? Yeah, that sounds good. I'll have a couple of announcements and then we'll split people again in breakout rooms so they can connect. Uh, Gil, thank you so much for My spending pleasure. your time with us. Um, it was really valuable uh, lessons for me uh, and I think for everybody else as well. Um, and everybody, don't forget uh, to grab Gil's handout, which summarizes the main points. So you have that in your toolkit from now on. And then, uh, let me just see. Oh, sorry.